The Dukes of Dice are brought to you by Tasty Minstrel Games, Arcane Wonders, Game Toppers, Dua Lipa, and listeners like you. Welcome to the Duchy. It's time for another episode of the Dukes of Dice podcast, a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. Coming to you from the Duchy of the Duke City, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the Gateway City, St. Louis, Missouri, it's the Dukes of Dice, a podcast about board card and occasionally role-playing games. Today, the Dukes take a look at Gizmos from Simon, designed by Phil Walker Harding. They'll also take a look back at their review of Lignum in their Dukes double take. And now, the Dukes of Dice. Everybody, welcome back to the podcast. This is Sean and also Alex, and welcome to episode 185, which we're calling Lincoln Cogs. That title, thanks to Nick Hayes over our board game geek guild. What a fantastic name, Alex, because we're talking about gizmos and all the wonderful gears and cogs and pistons and ramps and other machines, simple machines. I don't know, uh, but we're also talking about Lignum, a game about wood cutting in our duke's double take and uh, lincoln logs lincoln cogs that's pretty fantastic don't you think can i can i tell you this sean yes this is the most competitive naming an episode i've ever seen uh the guild was big this week it was hard to crack the top six there were three names we couldn't decide between and normally it's a case where i'm lobbying for one you're lobbying for one and we do schwazi to kind of duel off no we did schwazi because we literally couldn't decide between three of these names yeah, it was that close. So not to get too inside baseball off the top, but man, oh man, the guild was crushing it this week. Yeah, definitely for sure. And we will uh, probably give a little more of that backstory when we talk about the runners up at the bottom of the episode. Yep. By the way, we get all of this amazing help naming these episodes over on our board game Geek guild guild number 2008. Uh, before the episode, we put up our dupes on deck. So if you want to go and preview what's going to be talked about in the episode, you can do that. And you can even contribute, whether it's naming an episode or providing a contribution for some commentary about some of the games we'll be talking about. Uh, Alex, how you doing? I'm good. I have that Dua Lipa song stuck in my head, as folks from the uh, beginning know. You know what I'm talking about, Sean? Are you, are you hip enough on the music? No, I had to look her, look her up on Wikipedia. What's the name of the horn that they blow in, in the World Cup? Uh, oh, the Vuvuzela. Okay, I was like, is it something like that? That was just at the South Africa World Cup. I don't think they've had those at, at World Cup since, because boy, oh boy, are those things annoying. Anyway. So that's what's stuck in your head? That specific song, not the Vuvuzela. No, that'd be weird. Uh, no, that song, and then I saw Chromio in concert. I don't know if anyone knows Chromio, but I've had a bunch of his songs stuck in my head too. So it's been that kind of a week for songs getting stuck in my head and being busy and doing board gamey stuff. And I don't know, I'm fine. Do you know what's been stuck in my head, Alex? What's that? Lawyer stuff? The Weezer cover of Africa. Toto's Africa with Weird Al? Oh, yeah, I heard that. I, I wasn't that impressed, honestly. Well, because you're dead inside, Alex, clearly. No, but apparently this came out months ago, and I just heard about it today, and Mariah knew about it, and she's like, oh, yeah, whatever. I'm like, why didn't you tell me? Like, you know I would have loved that. But anyway, uh, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing good. It's, uh, we just came from Chewy's open house over at her preschool. And uh, she's a crazy animal, and that's that's cool. And it's super hot down here in the dungeon of the Duchy, Alex. So I'm pretty sweaty right now. I would take my pants off, but I'm worried about the spiders because this is now their domain, as I mentioned last episode. I'm just a I am just a guest here in the spider the spider queen's lair. Well, I wish you the best of luck surviving. Yeah. Good luck. Well, Alex, uh, should we talk about some board games? We sure should. Hey, Sean, are you going to be talking about 18xx games and heavy affairs today? Mm, Sadly, no. Yeah, no, unfortunately not. But I did play one good game and one not so good game. So in no particular order, I'll tell you both of them and you tell me which one you think I think was the good game and which one was the bad game. So. Game one is Thanos Rising by USAopoly. And the second game was Tower of Madness by Smirk and Dagger. Which one did I like and which one did I not like? And by the way, they both have a Yahtzee-ish component to them. I think based on the way you are framing this question, I think the only possible answer to this is the one you liked was not Thanos Rising. I think it's the other one. So I liked Tower of Madness. Okay. Yes. I thought you were phrasing it in a weird way 
to get out of the answer somehow, but you just didn't remember the name of the game. I did not remember the name of the game. <laughs> okay. I was looking up something in the other, other tab, which happens a lot with this. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, which one should I talk about first, and then you'll, and then you'll learn? If you're uh, talk about Thanos Rising first. Okay. So Thanos Rising is a game that Matthew and Matt uh, of Wham! fame, not, not George Michael Wham!, but our website Wham!, although they haven't done anything in a while, but that's, that's another issue. Uh, but anyway, they've been playing Thanos Rising a ton for the last like two months, and it looks like a really terrible Ameritrash game that I would just absolutely hate. And the weird thing is that it's a bunch of dice rolling, it's a Yahtzee mechanic, it's random, things are happening all over the place, and it's just not a game I would, would have thought that Matthew would have liked. And so it's just weird that, that they've been crazy about this game. Uh, and I've put it off. I haven't wanted to play it whatsoever. So last night at Dukes of Dice game night, they convinced me to play it, and I'm, I'm dragged to the table. I'm just like, well, I don't want to play this. Uh, no, I liked it quite a bit, Alex, actually. It was, uh, it was good. So you're wrong. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the idea here is that you are trying to prevent Thanos from collecting the Infinity Stones. And obviously this is the, the Marvel, you know, Marvel theme with the Avengers and, and Thanos and everything and all of that. Uh, so at the start of your turn, it's a cooperative game, start of your turn, you're rolling some dice, uh, which will determine how much, um, how many cubes you're adding to a particular infinity stone and also what Thanos does. Cause Thanos is basically rotating between these three sectors and either attacking heroes that are there or triggering villains that are there to take some sort of action. And so on your turn, you're going to, you're going to place your team on one of those sectors and then roll. And your team consists of a starter hero plus heroes that you manage to recruit throughout the game. And the more heroes you have, the more special abilities, the more dice you might get, uh, re-rolls, um, just cool, cool effects that can happen. And so you have a pool of dice that you start with, and there's, it's four, uh, four dice, but there are four different types of die. Um, there is the like technology dice, there's uh, the arcane dice, for lack of a better word, there's the space dice, and there's like a kapow dice. Uh, all different colors. Now, one of each symbol is on all of these dice, but if it's uh, the matching color die, it actually has three of those symbols. One of them is a double symbol. So you're more likely, if I'm rolling red power kapow dice, I'm more likely to roll the, the kapows or whatever they're called. So you roll your dice, and then you have to assign them to cards in the sector. So cards have a certain number of symbols, uh, like two space and one kapow. And if it's a hero, you're able to recruit that hero and you'll be able to use it on your next turn. If it's a villain, then you're going to assign a damage and some of them have between like two and three damage. Uh, and the object is to basically kill off enough villains. There's kind of an easy mode where you kill off seven, uh, kill them off before 10 of your heroes are killed or before Thanos is able to collect all of the infinity stones. And it was, it was surprisingly good. I, I'm still surprised that Matthew likes it, but I, I wound up liking it. It's, it's got that Yahtzee mechanic, which I like in certain games. And it also, it, it was just thematic. So we talked about Hail Hydra last week, right? And yeah, there were some thematic things and, and the, the theme of it was it's the strongest part of the game for me. Uh, but this was an interesting, uh, interesting decisions the whole cooperative tension of, oh man, I don't want my Black Panther to die, but we really need your Doctor Strange to, to do this or that. So I, I was pleasantly surprised. And the theme, obviously, it's a, it's a theme that, that I like. Uh, by the way, I'm currently on issue 31 of the 1998 Black Panther series. Oh, good you know, job. Got, did, I mention, did I mention last week that I've got the Marvel Unlimited Pass? So you I've did, got, yep. like, all of Marvel Comics. Oh my God, it's so awesome. Uh, by the way, did you see the Captain Marvel trailer? Yes. I can't wait for that. I'm so excited. Uh, but yeah, so surprisingly, uh, even though I was dragged kicking and screaming to the table to play this, I liked it quite a bit. And I mean, it is, it, it is nothing, nothing amazing. And it's not these days, my type of game, but for kind of a beer and pretzels game that you can have a newer gamer play cause it's cooperative and. And it's got a great theme. Um, I ah, I might pick up a copy, even though it's kind of it's ah, yeah. I might pick it up. I liked it. 
Now, based on what you were describing, I know the mechanics aren't similar, but it, it occurred to me that it might have some similarities to Pandemic the Cure in some form or fashion. Is there any overlap oh, yeah. there? Yeah, I think you might be right. I mean, I'm thinking of a game like um, uh, what uh, Elder Sign, right? There's a reminiscent of Elder Sign, I think, is probably what's a little bit closer to. I think Pandemic the Cure is kind of a lighter, slightly lighter Elder Sign, but it's definitely in that family of games. Got it. Okay. But it had enough so, it had enough meat to it where your big issue with the cure was there just wasn't enough going on there for you to, to really get well, into it. Here's the thing. It's probably the same amount of meat, but this is where the theme elevates it a mm-hmm. little bit more. Right? Interesting. So if, if it were pandemic Marvel, I, I probably would have liked it more. Fair enough. So that is Thanos Rising from USAopoly. Very cool. Game I'm going to talk about is a game that if you were to go on Amazon right now, Sean, right this very moment, you could buy this game for $9.72 on Amazon Prime. Its MSRP is nowhere near that. Uh, The fact that this game is at at that price level is crazy to me until you see the BGG rating for this game. The game, by the way, is High Tide uh, from Queen Games, designed by Dirk Hen. If that name sounds familiar, it's because he has won... A uh, Spiel des Jahres Award. He's also the designer of uh, Alhambra. Uh, what else has he oh, done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I believe is what he won the Spiel for. Any case, uh, also did Shogun. That sounds right. Yeah. So should I wait? Am I buying this? Am I buying this? Are you buying this specific game? Yeah, for nine no. bucks. Am I buying it? No, I, I don't think so. There's a uh, reason it's nine bucks because it's a big it's a big box board game. It's okay, a, it's, it's a big box queen game. It's one of these queen games that comes with uh, like four or five expansions built in. Uh, yeah. So the core game is very light and there's these other little mini expansions baked into it. Here's the game, Sean, and you tell me at the end of this if you think 972 is going to make a lot of sense to, to drop on this. Okay. So the game, the premise of the game is you are trying to get the best possible view of the ocean, get your deck chair as close as possible to the shoreline without your deck, without your chair being in the water. Okay. And you're going to score at the end of the game on five different five, five or six different tracks on the beach for how close you're going to get in ranked order. So first place on that track is going to get some points. Second place is going to get some points. Third place is going to get some points. I think it's certain player counts. It's just the top two players. That gets you the gist. How it works is, is pretty simple. You are going to, the first player is going to draw two dice out of a bag, roll them. The dice are of different colors. So the color represents where, what track you're moving up on and the number represents how far you're moving up. You can choose to take those two dice or pass. If you pass, you draw two new dice out of the bag, roll them. If you pass on those, you got to take whatever the third set of dice is left. Let's say you passed on the first two. There are two dice kind of just sitting there. The next player would get a chance to either pick those dice, possibly getting a chance to re-roll some or all of the dice. Uh, And if they didn't want to do that, they could go to the next one. If they didn't like that, again, they have uh, a third chance, and otherwise they are stuck with whatever's left. By the time everyone's drafted, using these really cute little towel pieces... There are going to be two dice left. The bigger number represents uh, where the ocean's going to come in further. The smaller number represents where it's going to come in less. So as you go, the game, you know, you're adding shoreline, and the shoreline kind of moves in different ways and gets closer and closer, and the game will end either after a certain number of rounds, or it'll end when one person's deck chair, uh, beach chair, is in the water. That's effectively the game. That's the base game, which we didn't play with any of the expansions. There's a Baywatch expansion. There's a Shark expansion. There's a Surfer expansion. There's all sorts of little stuff going on in here. Uh, I will say the consensus on BGG is, eh, it's got a 6.1. But man, for 972, if you're looking for a gateway game, it's not half bad. It really isn't. We at, we played at max player count at, at 6. And there were definitely a lot of like, screwing the other person over, kind of laughing about it a little bit, oh, getting a little too close, whatever else. So it was engaging and fun, and I'm glad it's in the Monochromatic Wolf library, but uh, I don't know. For 972, Sean, what do you think? I'll, I'll pass. Yeah, I thought so. That's a, that's a Chipotle burrito. I'd rather enjoy a Chipotle burrito <laughs> than... <laughs> did I Interesting. Ever tell you about... Did I ever tell you about the friend of mine in high school that everything was was quantified in the value of Jumbo Jacks from Jack in the Box? <laughs> He's like, dude, I could like get six Jumbo Jacks for that. That's that the is voice. A... That's the voice I do for him, or I did for him. Right. And he had a voice he did for me. It, yeah. That that is an interesting way of assessing things. There's no doubt. 
It's a good, it's he a good was, marker. Uh, he was a cheap, he was a cheap friend. I, we'd always yeah, go to I can Denny's. imagine. We'd always go to Denny's and uh, he would never order anything except water and then always demand like a bite of everyone's plate and then like a sip of everyone's soda. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Makes sense. Yep. All right. Anyway, that's High Tide from Queen Games, designed by Dirk Hen. So we don't have a discussion topic this week, so I'm, I'm just going gonna, gonna to add a little bit here to go a little bit, a little bit longer in our recent plays to kind of make up for that. So Alex, uh, one of your favorite games, uh, Raquel and I got a play of, The Mind. The Mind. Yeah, and I won't go too long into this. We didn't have a copy of The Mind, but I had a copy of The Walking Dead, the card game, which was basically Six Nymphed which has like one to 104 and you just need a deck of one to a hundred. And then we just track the rest on my phone and download the rules on my phone. Uh, so we played two player and I was like, all right, let's see if Raquel likes it. She loved it. She absolutely loved it. And boy, did we have a good time? We, we won, we got through all 12 rounds and this is a game where basically uh, you are, you each have a hand of one card and then two cards and then three cards in each round you gain more cards and you just have to play them in sequential order but you're not going in turn. You're not uh, communicating really other than through mind melding with your, with your partners. Uh, so obviously if I've got a 98, I'm going to just kind of sit back and say, mm, you know, go for it. I'm not going to say that, but I'm, I'm thinking that. Uh, so we had a ton of fun with it and we had zero lives left in the 12th round. We had two cards in hand, uh, one, one each. I had 94. She had 96. We didn't know that, right? And we were both just like, ah, and we did it. We pulled it off and it was a lot of fun. So she loved it. Those are great moments. Oh, it was a ton of fun. And so I actually wound up picking up a, a copy, the actual copy at Empire last night. So I'm looking, looking forward to that. So the other thing I just want to mention real quick, which I'm super excited for, not, not, not playing it yet, it is Great War Commander, which is basically a World War I combat commander game which rory picked up and uh, he just wanted me to take it home and read the rules because that's that's what i do so i'm super excited for for great war commander super you, excited you just had to squeeze one of those in there didn't you just well, just had to get it. one of them in yeah hopefully hopefully i'll report back on that soon um okay but here's here's the second game that uh that i had mentioned before and that is tower of madness by smirk and dagger games and it's interesting because this is also a yahtzee style game it is a Cthulhu-themed game, uh, but in addition, there is also a Kerplunk element. Did you ever play Kerplunk? Do you remember Kerplunk? That's the one with the sticks where you're kind of pulling the sticks out and there's marbles. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So, so, so this is the game, Tower of Madness. It is Yahtzee, Kerplunk, Cthulhu. Just huh. mashing, mashing it all together. And I got to tell you, the table presence on this game is incredible because you have this really nice tower that sits on this like reservoir that's going to collect the marbles. And then you have these bright green like tentacle skewers that go through uh, the tower. And so you just have all, I mean, and they're like probably, I don't know, four inches, five inches. I'm looking at this now and whoa. It looks super cool. The production, well, some of the production on this is really good. Um, that specifically, just the way it looks on the table. And even like the tower, we were trying to figure out how to fit it back in the box at the end. Well, it's magnetic, like two ends of the tower fold around. It's magnetic. Um, and so it just folds apart. It was, it was really interesting. So the idea here is that it's, it's competitive, but you can all lose together. And each round you're trying to win a particular location uh, by having the highest total investigation. And locations are worth different points between like eight and 12 or something like that. But also the locations have certain special abilities that slightly tweak the rules of the game. There are five dice, one to six, but they also have, in addition to the number, a different symbol. So there's the classic, you know, Lovecraftian uh, symbology where there's like a, a magnifying glass and a brain and a heart and uh, a, a portal and, and whatever. So what you have to do is you roll all five dice and you have to assign at least one per roll. And in order to be a successful investigator, you have to be able to have a one, two, and a three. And then the other two dice, you just need to be the highest value you can get them. So if I get my one, two, or three, I'm a successful investigator. And my other two dice are, let's say, a four and a six. 
So I've got 10. That's pretty good. Then Alex, you go, you get a successful investigation, but you roll an 11. You are now the lead investigator and are set to win that particular round. And then the next person goes, maybe they fail their investigation. They're not even in the running and, and so on until you, until you go around. Now, if you fail your investigation, you're going to be pulling out the, the tentacle skewers from the, the tower, and then some marbles might fall out, and you're going to collect them. So if it's a white marble, it is a spell, and you get to add it to your little, your little player board, and you get to draw a new spell card, which is, uh, you know, they break the rules of the game. It might be a, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a blue marble, and they're worth an extra three points for all the ones you collect. Or if it's a red marble, then it's madness. And if you have four red marbles, you go insane, and now you're, you're just trying to screw everyone else up. Um, additionally, there are three green doom marbles. And if the third doom marble comes out, then the game is over and everyone loses. So that is basically how you play. Uh, I did not care for this game very much at all because there weren't really a lot of interesting decisions. Your turn kind of plays itself. Uh, do you roll the one, two or three? Yeah, cool. It, but there was nothing interesting. Like in Thanos rising, you had tough decisions to make. Here, the game was kind of on rails. Um, If you ever roll exactly two fives in a roll, then you can claim one of these kind of once per round special abilities. So there's some choice there. Um, And there's some interesting variability in terms of the location rules as as you progress through the deck. But man, it was, uh, despite it looking cool on the table, despite the components being really cool, uh, it just, you weren't offered much in the way of choice. And um, it just wasn't uh, wasn't particularly enjoyable. So, yeah. So I was looking at the production of this, and it is it. You are correct. It has a crazy good table presence. I think though, it suffers from some of the table presence in looking at it just from a gameplay perspective, because at least in Kerplunk, you can kind of see it's a transparent container that's holding the marbles. And you can sort of see where a bunch of them might be or might not be or whatever else is. And maybe change your decision based off of that. Maybe. I mean, I know it's tricky, but there's a possibility at least. With this, because the tower is completely enclosed and you can't see any marbles, it seems like it's pretty much a random pull. Am I, am I wrong there? Right. But, it, but that's not the main mechanism. Mm-hmm. Whereas in Kerplunk, that's the main mechanism. I mean, certainly like... As early in the game, we were like, well, we don't want any marbles. And then as we were playing, we we're like, oh, wait, we do want some marbles because if you're getting new spell cards, if you're getting extra points, those are all really good. So like at first we were kind of drawing from the top and then one player or Chris, our buddy Chris uh, had a thing where the three point marbles were actually worth five for him. So he was trying to pull like crazy. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's not the main, the Kerplunk is not the main mechanic. So I think it's fine that it's hidden. And it's it's random, but as a whole, it just was not terrific. Fell flat. Yeah, yeah. So that Bummer. is T- Tower of Madness from Smirk and Dagger. Awesome. Well, I'm going to be talking about a big release. Sean, have you heard of this game, Paper Tales? I have. I've actually spent a, a five or ten minutes watching it played. I, I'd like to. I'd like to play it. Yeah, it's. Ooh, I'm not sure totally where I feel about this one. So, so let's talk it through. Paper Tales is a game where you are drafting a, a set of cards for a kingdom every turn. Uh, you have certain cards that are maybe combat heavy. You have certain cards that produce different resources. You have certain cards that have other effects. The trick of it is the game will play o- over several phases. So a typical turn will consist of draft cards, draft five cards, then set at least at the start of the game, four of them, place them in some sort of a formation. The front two are, are, have combat strength. The back two can be resource producing. Really, you can put resource producers anywhere. Pay the cost to put those into play. Check in, uh, There's a war phase where you check and see if you have more combat than your neighbors. If you do, you get some, some number of points, seven wonder style. If not, it's tough, tough luck. Then you go to uh, basically an effects phase and, and try and build and age your, age your people. And it's meant to sort of tell this story of a kingdom as you're going, right? It's a, it's a fairly streamlined down type of drafting game where you have some interacting effects. Uh, 
As you have resources, you're able to build new buildings, which can give you benefits during different phases, might give you extra combat, or might give you access to more resources. Uh, in order to do so, in some cases, as you build more and more buildings, there's land costs that come associated with it. Gold is very tight and very important in this game. That's really the gist of it, though. You're playing this over, I believe, four rounds uh, of, of drafting, setting up your, your kingdom, drafting again, setting up your kingdom, drafting again, setting up your kingdom. Some cards will persist round to round. Some cards will age and die round to round. Am I, I think I'm, I'm encapsulating this as a whole. So that's Paper Tales from Stronghold. What did I think about it? I don't know. Maybe it was because it was late in the night. It was the last game we were playing at Monochromatic Wolf Game Night, which is now an official Tuesday thing if you're in St. Louis. Feel free to stop oh. on by. Just saying. Not an official plug, but kind of an official plug. Uh, it just... It, uh, there was a very mixed reception to this one at the table, ultimately. It, I don't know why I have this association, because there is not a mechanical similarity but there was something about this, I think it was the buildings primarily, that was reminiscent enough of Machi Koro that it proved to be a bit of a turnoff for me. Additionally, it, it's a game that has a thematic story or is trying to tell a thematic story, and ultimately it just feels like a midweight drafting game, a midweight drafting huh. card game. Eh. Eh. I don't know if I can recommend it. I might need to play it again at a time that's not, say, 11 o'clock at night on a Tuesday. But initial impressions, meh, not so much for me. So yeah, that's Paper Tales from Stronghold. Well, well hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What, what? Oh, you want to talk about this? All right. No, 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 I haven't played it, but, but it, it is, my understanding is it's slightly more complex than Seven Wonders? Uh, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's and got, seven, a, if you look on BGG, the weight rating for Paper Tales is a 2.15. And, and Seven Wonders used to be one of, was it your number one game? Yeah, originally it was my number one game of all time. And let's just didn't do it for you. It's just the persistent buildings, the resource management element of it wasn't very engaging. Interestingly enough, by the way, the, the weight rating for Seven Wonders is 2.34. So BGG thinks Paper Tales is lighter. Okay. I don't know if I'd agree with that, but I, I could kind of see where they're coming from. Some of the science scoring is a little wonky in Seven Wonders. Eh, for my money, I think Paper Tales is, is a little bit trickier to get into. Just a bit. Will I like Paper Tales? No. Really? Okay. I'm, I'm not 100% on that, but I'm, eh, I, I don't think you'll like this one. Okay. Would 2014 Sean have liked Paper Tales? Maybe. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ah, oh, what a simpler time. Yeah, what a simpler time. A, a time when not every game had to have meat on the bones. Sometimes a game was just a game, and Sean could enjoy it. Hey. But no, you got to get all complex now. And hey, I like Thanos Rising. And dry and boring and ugh. Yeah. Anyway, Paper Tales, Stronghold Games. Check it out or don't. <laughs> That's what we've been playing. Let's take it on over to the news desk. All right, a bunch of news this week, but some kind of quicker items here. Let's talk through the first one. Tabletopia is now <gasps> available on Android. <laughs> that was a weird reveal, Alex. I know. I could tell people were hanging on every last word. Sean, are you a big Tabletopia player? Uh, no, I'm not, but I, but I have it on Steam, and I've, I've played several games there. In fact, uh, our buddy Ellie... He, uh, he and, and our, my other buddy, Lee, you haven't met Lee, uh, they've been designing a game and they have it up on Tabletopia. So that's one of the cool things about it is it is a way that you can kind of prototype some stuff in a, in a digital form. In fact, I played uh, Black Orchestra, the Philip DeBerry game. Uh, I played that with, with, uh, with him, with Philip DeBerry, uh, a couple months before it came out on Tabletopia. And uh, so I think it's cool. I think it's cool that that's there. And what's interesting about it is there's no, it's not like when you play a game on Boitajou or uh, any of the other online things, there's no rules enforcement. It's just, you are interacting with these digi digital, physical, for lack of a better term, components, right? There's, there's physics to it. And uh, so you are, you just have to know how to play 
and and that's that's all there is to it. Uh, so it's, I think it's, it's cool. The, it's it's the most one to one representation of a of a tabletop experience you're going to find in a digital space. Right. Because much like being at a table in person, the game's not going to run itself when you're right. chucking dice or flipping cards or whatever else. You have to physically play the game. Yeah, you have to do the upkeep. You have to all of that. So, uh, so yeah, I think that's I think it's cool that it's being brought to more platforms. Yeah, more accessible for more folks. Uh, all right, Sean, do you watch the Goldbergs? Have you ever seen mm-hmm. that show? So I have seen two episodes of it. I guess all of the seasons are available on Hulu. And um, I, so I watched the first two episodes and it was fine. It's a fine traditional style sitcom. Yeah. I don't have much of a taste for the kind of the traditional sitcom, by the way. The whole laugh track or whatever else. Eh. I mean, the closest, closest to that that I can get into is Modern Family, and Modern Family certainly does not have a laugh track. Ooh, so I wouldn't, call, I wouldn't call Modern Family a traditional sitcom. No, I wouldn't either. Modern Family has, you know, it has interviews and stuff. Like, it's, got, it's the office style, so I wouldn't call it a traditional sitcom. But yeah, Goldberg's very much is. I'm pretty sure it has a laugh track. And it's got um, Jeff, I can't remember his name. Jeff uh, Goldblum. From, uh, Curb Your... No, wow, that would be pretty cool, though. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jeff Garland. There we go from Curb Your Enthusiasm, and it's got uh, Wendy McClendon, McClendon from Reno Nine One One, which was a fantastic show, which you apparently didn't watch much. Of. Didn't watch much. Watched every now and then. Oh, so good, so good. Anyway, that's not the point. Let's talk about the Goldbergs because for for a reason that will become clear <laughs> that that might have been baffling prior to this to this very moment. Uh, so I don't watch the show. I don't know much about the characters of the show, but. Restoration Games was tweeting a whole bunch uh, just the other day like, hey, are you guys fans of the Goldbergs? We're fans of the Goldbergs. Hey, tune in tonight. You might see something cool. Hey, tune in. And hey, sure enough, they were able to get a prototype to the folks on the Goldbergs, which is a show set in, I believe, the 80s. So it kind of fits in with the time and fits in with the nostalgia. And they were playing Fireball Island, I believe the newer edition of it, on the Goldbergs. No, it was just it was just interesting that uh, apparently the the creator of the show had actually reached out to Restoration to try and get the game for the show, and sure enough, on on an episode this past week, it it was on TV. And hey, it's always cool to see uh, board games, especially hobby games, in a more mainstream spotlight. So that was a that was a cool little thing to see. Congrats as always to the folks at Restoration who, as so, always, killing it. So here's my question, right? They've got. They've got network television ABC money over on the Goldbergs. They can't go onto eBay and spend like 300 bucks on the old Fireball Island. So you're saying you would have preferred if they were, were authentic to the time period. Yeah, it's, it's an anachronism, Alex, to mm. have a 2018 Fireball Island in a show taking place in 1988 or whatever. Well, I think you should write them a strongly worded letter. <laughs> it would take me out of the narrative, Alex. Yeah, yeah. Would it on this sitcom, this this laugh out loud, oddball goofball sitcom? I don't know. Anyway, Pat no- Oswald is the is the narrator. Oh, that's good. I like Pat yeah. Oswald. Yeah, Pat Oswald's great. All right, cool. Well, that's Fireball Island, uh, which is apparently eh, it's starting to make its way over into the U.S. You'll you'll see that around. That's my understanding. In any case, all right. Next up. Essen is just around the corner, a few short weeks away from the time this episode drops, and we're starting to hear bits and pieces, but we always like reboots, uh, as, as, as was just clear from the past item of news, and saw this item on BGG, the game Mississippi Queen, which won the Spiel des Jahr in 1997, there is going to be a new version of it, a, a revamped version of this, put out by Super Meeple a French publisher. Sean, have you played this game before? If you, are you familiar with it? No, uh, I'm, I'm tangentially familiar with it, but no, I haven't played it before. So the, the original version, I just happened to see out on a table, uh, uh, at, uh, at work the other day. And really interesting. You have steamboats that you are trying to kind of navigate around, uh, increasing and decreasing speed kind of formula day style as you zigzag through the river, trying to pick up passengers and ultimately make your way to the beach. The passengers in this case are, are kind of old, old school Southern bells. Uh, there are little wheels that turn on the boat that indicate how much coal you have left. Coal is what you use to uh, either increase or decrease speed more rapidly or turn faster. 
Uh, and then you have a certain speed in how fast your boat goes. If you crash into the rocks, you're done. If you go off the, the riverbank, you're done. That's the core of it. It's it's not a rolling move. It's a chip-in move? I, I don't know. Uh, but kind of a steering game where you're trying to out-logistic other people. Pick up and deliver. Pick up and deliver game would be the best way to put that. So uh, that's coming out. Uh, there's going to be a preview of it at Spiel this year. I don't know when it might come over to the U.S. or what the timing's going to be on that, but for folks who are fans of old-school Spiel games, I thought that was pretty cool. Did that really just happen? Did this just happen? Did what just happen? You made it through that whole piece of news? I know. Without singing? Without singing? Without singing what? Oh, that song? Yeah. That's the, the song that's the name of the game. Mississippi Queen. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm just shocked. I, yeah, okay. It didn't even click, Sean. I, it didn't wow. even click. I got wow. too much Dua Lipa in the head. There's no space for Mississippi Queen right now. <laughs> That'd be like a board I got game that, that came out called, called Bohemian Rhapsody. And you're just like, oh, all right. <laughs> Actually, no, that's not fair to compare Mississippi Queen to Bohemian Rhapsody. I take that back. Uh, <laughs> not but, on the same level, huh? No, no, no. By no, by no means. Fair enough. <sighs> all right. All right. Take us home, Alex. All right. Kickstarter. Kickstarter, Sean. And this one, this one could be a reasonably quick one. But, Sean, this is, uh, this is a game from your, dare we say, favorite publisher? I don't know if GMT's um, overtaken Capstone, but... I would say, I would say GMT, Capstone, and What's Your Game are probably in my, they're my top three. Okay. Is that right? Is that right? All right. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, Stonemeyer's up there too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's hard to pick favorites, Sean. It's it like really picking is. your favorite kids. It's like, it's like ranking things. I mean, how would we even rank things? Am it's I sort right? of like my list of 10. Or a list of yes. six when whenever we do rankings that weren't actually rankings. By we, I mean me. Uh, so yeah, fair enough. This is The Climbers, but not, I mean, The Climbers itself has already been released, but no, this is The Climbers XL. This is a version of The Climbers, which is the wooden climbing game that got a lot of love from Heavy Cardboard, and uh, Sean, you and I have both played this game. We actually played it together back in Albuquerque. This is a version that is 50% larger than the original. So giant wood blocks, giant, giant, giant wood blocks. In fact, this game, Sean, the XL version, is 15 pounds, 15 Ooh. pounds made of maple and Chinese cherry wood. So Ooh. a hefty, big time, solid wood production. Uh, they yep. also have the night version of the game, which adds uh, five new player colors. You can play that standalone or combine it with the original to play the climbers with Oh boy, 10 players? That seems a little crazy. Oh. Yeah. So this one just launched this past week. This is a hefty pledge, though, if you want to get on board. These, these giant versions of games are no joke. If you'll recall, Giant Azul, for instance, was $200. This isn't quite that steep. We're talking, though, for this game, $99 for a base game pledge of Climbers XL. If you want to add Climbers Knight in there with it, that's going to be $130. So, Sean... Does this have your attention? Oh, absolutely. So, so Climbers is fantastic. You liked it quite a bit, right? I liked it a decent amount. Yeah. A yeah. I, I, I think I liked it a little mm. less than you, but not, not a lot less. So yeah, this is part of their Simply Complex line where it is a, for all intents and purposes, a lighter game, but there's some good meat on the bones here. And uh, it, is, it is great. It's basically these different shaped blocks, uh, cubes and rectangular and they have different colors on each side, and you're moving them and rotating them to match your player piece, and you're trying to ascend up. Um, and, and there's something very, um, primal's not the right word, but it just feels like it's building blocks, right? Like as a kid, and you have fun building the towers and making walls and all sorts of stuff, and you're doing it, you're, it's gamified now, and, and it's really cool. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know that I would necessarily kickstart it, but it would be a great, I mean, it would be a great piece to have. Um, I think I would probably kickstart it if Empire weren't going to get a copy. And I think that they probably will, but it's pretty cool. It's, it's pretty dang cool. It'll certainly have some good table presence. If Empire jumps yeah. on this, I think it'd be a good, it would be a good fit for the cafe. And yeah, a good absolutely. fit for the cafe scene. So 
which I believe is referenced on the Kickstarter page in some form or fashion. So if you're a board game cafe owner, hey, I don't know. Take a look at this. Will you be pledging, Sean? Will you be jumping in? Um, if I'm gonna, if I were to do it, I would do the 130 to get the expansion. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, yeah, it just makes sense. But would you do it? I, I don't. I right now probably not. Okay. All right. Alex, well, I'm, I'm sure Clay will send you a, a nasty note. I, I don't. I don't think he will. Uh, yeah. So Alex, I spend a lot of money for Chewy's preschool. Like a <laughs> lot of money. My, <laughs> A lot of money. My Kickstarter habits have have shrunk drastically. As yeah, a result. that's fair. I, look, I'm not a parent yet. I, I can imagine. I can imagine yeah. it's only going to get worse by the time I'm I'm hopefully in in that same boat. So, uh, sorry about it. I guess. Sorry about that that preschool money. Hopefully, it's paying off. I don't know. Is it paying uh, off? She can write a five page or five paragraph essay now. A so five page essay. Whoa. No, no, five paragraph. Five paragraph. Oh, okay. That's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, for a four year old, it's like, you know. Uh huh. What, what can you do? <laughs> now, I will say this uh, normally, by the time we talk about Kickstarters, these are projects that either have already funded or well exceeded their funding goal. I think because of the nature of the print run of something like this, it's got to be a pretty beefy one. And that's no surprise to me. Uh, it's set at a hundred thousand, the the funding goal. As of the time of this recording, this may have changed by the time you hear this episode. It's at eleven thousand, and it's only been a day. Eh, it's a bit of a slow start. We'll see if it picks up for them, but that might be a close Hopefully call. So, if this is something you're interested in, go go check this out. Pledge, get it funded. You got until October seventeenth to do so. That is a look at the climbers XL, and that is a look at the news. So, Alex, you're coming up in the world. You got yourself a new game table. Wait a minute. It's not quite a game table, is it? Well, it might as well be for all intents and purposes. It's a game topper. It's a Watson model game topper. It's perfect for game night. Plenty of room for people to play. Really upgrades the whole look and feel. Turns what's normally just a typical dining room table into the perfect game gaming space. So, I love my Watson, and I'm sure plenty of other people out there do, too. So let me get this straight. You get the best of both worlds. You get your conventional dining table plus an amazing game table all in one. It's like Christmas in July. Well, that Berkey is one innovative dude, and uh, I'm excited at some point to play on your game topper. Well, you got to come out here to St. Louis and come visit me for Alex Con. Hmm. That's Game Toppers. You can learn more about them at GameToppersLLC.com. The war lasted one hour and 45 minutes. No one remembers who fired first, but the outcome was worse than even the starkest of projections imagined. The simultaneous detonation of so many weapons attacked the planet on a subatomic level, scouring the atmosphere, boiling the seas, and turning forests to ash. To operate and survive in this new hostile environment, powerful walking war machines were created. Critical Mass is a game of hardcore, heavy-hitting mech-on-mech combat. As the pilot of a massive war machine, you must head out into the irradiated wastes and face down the unworthy upstarts who dare to challenge your dominion. After all, the honor of your survivor enclave is riding with you. Featuring simultaneous play with mech customization on the fly, the tension is sure to stay high in every fast-paced combat until the final armor plate is incinerated. Critical Mass is the latest in the Dice Tower Essentials line from Arcane Wonders, Be sure to keep an eye out for it later this year. It's not a blunder if you go with Arcane Wonders. You can find all their awesome titles at arcanewonders.com. Hey Alex, have you ever wondered what trolling would look like as a board game? I haven't. I think it would be a lot like nothing personal, but... Okay, well it's interesting that you say nothing personal, designed by Tom Vassell, because Trade on the Tigris is a game that was designed to troll Tom Vassell about trading on the Mediterranean. Oh, there you go. Trade on the Tigris is a brand new game from designers Ryan Sturm and Jeff Engelstein. In it, players will develop cities, trade with one another, and watch as the interactions you have 
will cause the sharing of philosophies between cultures. The very core belief of your city may change because of this, so you'll need to adapt and grow to score the most points to win the game. Trade on the Tigris will have a greater release later in 2018, but TMG has airshipped in a small number of copies to be sold exclusively at Gen Con, and TMG is excited to show off this awesome game at one of the biggest conventions in the world. If you can't make it to Gen Con, you can always check out all of TMG's awesome titles at their website, playtmg.com. Tasty Menstrual, mm-mm-mm, delicious games. Everything is splendor. Yes, it's a, it's a saying from the early days of the Dukes, but in the case of Gizmos, this is a game that is a possible splendor killer. Does it live up to that billing, or does this machine break and fall apart? We're talking Gizmos. So Gizmos is a recent production from Cool Mini or Not from Simon Games. It's designed by Phil Walker Harding. Phil Walker Harding, Alex, is a fantastic designer. Design games like Baron Park, uh, Cacao, Sushi Go. And in this latest of his, Gizmos, you are trying to build these contraptions that are going to give you extra bonus actions on your turn, and you're hopefully going to chain one action into another to create this wonderful machine that is super efficient and super powerful. So the object, of course, is to have the most points at the end of the game, and the game will end at the end of a full uh, number of turns after someone has built their 16th gizmo, or after someone has built their fourth level three gizmo. There's level one, two, and three uh, type gizmos. In the middle of the table, you're going to have this reservoir of different colored marbles. There's red, yellow, blue, and black. Am I missing one? Is it just the four, right? It's just the four. Red, yellow, blue, black. Um, and so you can't see the reservoir, but five or six marbles are going to come out in a line that you're able to see. And so if you pick a marble from there, then you know they'll, they'll rush down and a new one will take its place. So on your turn, you have exactly one action. And there are basically four things that you can do. You can pick a marble from the ones that are displayed and you, put, you take it and you put it in your little uh, marble reserve. It's a little circular piece of cardboard that keeps all your marbles from rolling around. Uh, initially, you can only ever hold five marbles at a time. Uh, so you just pick one. That's not super efficient, but that's something you can do. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can build one of the gizmos that's out in the middle of the table or one that you have privately reserved in your archive. And they cost a number of marbles indicated. Uh, so the level ones all cost one of a particular color. The level twos cost between, I think, like two and four. And then the level threes cost between like five and seven or something like that. Uh, typically all of the same color, although there are some level threes that you can uh, spend of any, of any color, basically. Uh, so you can build these. And once you build a gizmo, you're putting it in your little tableau, and it's going to give you some other bonus when you're taking a particular action. I'll come back to that to talk about in a second. Uh, the third action you could take is where you file something. This is where you're putting, you're reserving something from the central gizmos into your archive. And everyone starts with a bonus gizmo where whenever you file something, you're able to draw a random marble from the reservoir. So you don't know which one you're, you're taking. The last action is research. This is where you draw three cards from any of the, the, the tech decks, one, two, or three. And then you pick one and either build it if you have the marbles for it, or you archive it if you have the space in your archive. Initially, you can only archive one card at a time. So that's the gist of it. But the trick here, Alex, is that as you're building new gizmos, they're giving you bonus actions. So maybe I build a gizmo that says, whenever I pick a red marble, I can also pick a random marble from the reservoir. Or whenever I archive um, a card, I can pick a marble of my choice from the row. And let's say that I also have that one before that says when I pick red, I get a random. I can chain all of those together. And so instead of taking one marble at a time, I've now taken an action that's giving me like two marbles or three marbles or four marbles or doing some crazy stuff. There's also gizmos that are converters where it says I can turn one black marble 
uh, as part of my action into a marble of any color, or I can turn one blue marble into two and uh, to have it count as two blue marbles. There are things where I can increase the number of cards in my archive, the number of marbles that I, or sorry, they're, they're energy spheres, not marbles, energy spheres, Alex. Uh, increase the number of energy spheres I can have in my little, my little uh, collection, uh, or the, I can increase the number of cards I draw as part of a, uh, as part of a, a research action. So lots of cool things you can do. There's even cards that will give you extra experience points or victory points rather. So it might say whenever you build a black building or whenever you build a red or yellow building, get a victory point. So this game is very much about trying to chain together as much stuff as possible and to make best use of what you're getting um, by putting it into very specific things. And uh, it's, I think it's hard to describe more than that. I think that's the basic gist of it. So Alex, what are your initial thoughts on gizmos? Well, I got to admit, Sean, I was zoning out for a little bit there because Dua Lipa's One Kiss was again playing wow. on repeat in my brain. Just how it goes. To, to be fair, while you're talking, I'm typically thinking of how to improve one of my settlements in Fallout 4, which I've been playing nonstop for the last two weeks because it's oh, awesome. Yeah, I hear but you. Go, but go on. Let's, let's not think about what the other is talking about. Okay, occasionally, sometimes, I'll also be thinking about Rocket League plays and how I can improve my Rocket League game to really step okay. things up. So, and then I also uh, recently been researching how to possibly play Blood Bowl because uh, it's not out for Switch. My MacBook Air is incapable of playing it. So I'd like to play Blood Bowl, but just, yeah, it just hasn't happened, Sean. I'm very disappointed right. in myself on that front. Sorry, what were we talking about, Gizmos? Yeah, what do you think of Gizmos? Oh, hey, Gizmos. So I think Phil Walker Harding can have a very lucrative career if he just does what he's done with Baron Park and done with uh, Gizmos, which is take a game that has sort of become a staple. Uh, so your, your Splendor in the case of Gizmos, in the case of Baron Park Patchwork, and adding his own little twist in spin in a way that has you think, oh, wow, that was really clever and cool. In both of these cases, I think he really succeeds. I don't know if this is a Splendor killer for me, Sean. I just don't know if it's quite at that level. Because I don't know if it's, if it's quite accessible enough to hit that, that same kind of crowd that Splendor hits. But I think it hits its marks in a lot of ways. And I think for a gamer, for a typical gamer, you're going to find a lot to love in this game. A lot to love. Yeah, I, so I will agree with you. It doesn't kill Splendor in the sense that I'm going to pull out Splendor as a gateway game for a newer gamer. Someone's at game night and they're like, oh yeah, I've played Catan and that's about it right? Or Titan and Ticket to Ride. Okay, right. well, let's try Splendor, right? Um, so no, you're right. It, it is a little bit more complex than Splendor. And so in that sense, it doesn't kill it for me. But at the same time, I'm also not looking to pull out Splendor with a couple of regulars. We're going to play something more complex. And depending on the regular, we're going to play something way more complex, right? So Splendor is not a game that I'm thinking of for me, similar to, say, Century Spice Road. But this adds um, oh, so here's the comparison to Splendor, right? In Splendor, you are taking uh, three gems a turn, or you're reserving a card and getting a gold, or you're taking two gems of the same type. Here, if you're picking a marble, you're only getting one marble. So, you, so your actions are half or a third less than you get in Splendor, but you have the ability to, to build up your, um, your chain reactions to, to make more powerful actions, right? And so it's like you're paying for one of the mines in Splendor, but instead of it just being a mine that makes thing that might make certain things cheaper, it's a mine that now gives you some cool special ability. And if you can capitalize on that ability and synergize similar abilities, then you're going to be off to the races. So at the same time, (sighs) I, I struggled with this quite a bit because I played this at all player counts, two, three, and four. And I think I have a, a preferred player count, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And I'm wondering though, when I'm, I'm going to think to pull this out, but I may have a solution and we'll talk about that later. So that's my initial, initial thoughts. All righty. Rule book. Did you, uh, did you read the rule book, Alex? I did not. It was taught to me. So, and I don't recall us consulting it a ton. So, don't have a ton to say about the rule book. 
Yeah, so it was taught to me as well. And you're right. I mean, there's not, uh, there, there were a couple quarter cases, but nothing really significant. The, the big thing you would want to reference is some of the iconography, but I think for the most part, it was, it was pretty clear. Uh, there is a distinction between picking a marble out of the line versus doing a random draw from the reservoir. I think that, I, and I guess we're kind of jumping into components art here, I think that the iconography was pretty clear. And uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, easy enough. Hey, moving on. Uh, production. Sean, it's a Simon production here. Do yeah. the uh, art and graphics live up to that to that typical that typical stellar quality? Um, well, I mean, we're not talking about a Simon game in the sense of there's a bunch of minis, and they've been kind of branching out from that. So I think what we call a Simon game is probably going to need a new definition, especially as more of these titles come out. But I think overall the production was pretty was pretty interesting. So it doesn't use real marbles. It uses these plastic marbles, which for some reason was a bit of a knock in my mind. I would have preferred real marbles for some reason. Just they feel different. The density is different. The weight's different. Um, I didn't realize it at first, so it's not that much off. But eventually I'm like, oh, yeah, that's kind of weird. The reservoir is really cool. It has these tall walls, so you can't see what's in there. There are some issues with some of the marbles falling out of there and then underneath the contraption and not into the chute, the little, the little line of marbles. So that was uh, not, not a huge deal. And I think that um, one of the other things that kind of frustrated me was the level one, two, and three gizmos all have different card backs. There's not a quick way to tell the difference, though, on the face-up version between a level one and a level two card. Now, in theory, well, well, not in theory, in actuality, all the level one cards cost one, uh, exactly one, right? And then the, the level three cards kind of have a, a brown top as opposed to a gray top, but it would have been a little bit easier because there are some things that, that say when you, uh, you know, when you build a level two, it costs one less marble or, or whatever. I don't know. It's kind of, probably been a little nitpicky, but overall, I think it's a pretty good production. As far as the art goes, I wasn't particularly wowed by the art of the particular gizmos that you're building on the cards. Mm. So that's, that's my thoughts. What do you think? I, so I agree with you on, on a lot of the points. Uh, I will tell you, when you're talking about a Simon production, I'm also thinking of a game like Potion Explosion. Or excuse me, Potion Explosion is multiplayer solitaire. Uh, I don't know. That was, yeah, that, yeah, that song applies there too. Fair enough. Uh, so it has that same kind of interesting marble dispensing type of deal going on with it. Uh, I know what you're talking about with the, the marbles getting stuck. It did happen once in, in the plays I've had. So it, it, it certainly came up and I, I saw what you meant. But yeah, for the most part, it wasn't too big of an issue. I certainly didn't notice the other, the other marble problems. Uh, what else? Uh, no, I'd agree with you. The, the art doesn't really draw you in. Uh, I think from first first glance... This isn't going to appear to be a good game fit for a lot of gamers, right? I think the look of this game doesn't necessarily connote how how interesting it is in some ways. Would you agree with that, Sean? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. So I, I would say it's not a 100% wow, but I think it has that kind of table presence of that, oh, what's that cool feeder? That looks interesting. So I think there are elements of it that, that certainly are gonna, going to appeal to a lot of people. Uh, but I think it's let down in some ways by by the look of it, which is done in the name of easy iconography, which is always a good thing. Sure. But but you lose a little bit of the luster there, no doubt. Yeah, I think so. So really, this game is an engine builder. And longtime listeners of the show will know that I love engine building, but I'm sometimes terrible at it because I don't know when to stop building the engine and switch over to generate point mode, right? Um and so a game like Great Western Trail, which has a bit of engine building, but lets you continue to run run the that gizmo of yours past the point you normally would in most games is something I like. Uh, here, I, I felt pretty satisfied with the amount of engine building, and it didn't seem like there was necessarily a point when you had to switch switch gears. It was kind of baked in. And I don't know... I can't tell you why that is, and I'm curious if you agree with that or not. Hmm. 
And, and and let me let me say why for a couple of reasons. Number one, one of the major ways you're getting points is by building the gizmos because they're worth between like one and seven points, depending on the tier it is, and it's usually associated with the number of marbles you pay for it. Certain gizmos will give you these victory point chits if you do certain things, typically build a certain color of building. And I think you probably need to be earning chits, but they're they're only going to be a percentage of the points that you're scoring. Yeah. They're not they're not the they're not the majority of the points you're scoring. I mean, there's a point with a lot of these engine games where, as you mentioned, you have to flip the switch and knowing the timing of that is right. absolutely and utterly vital. And this is a game where there should be a certain point in it where just about every round you should be able to build a card. You should be able to right. just snap right into a card, just like in Splendor where there's a, a moment in that game where you can build basically any level one card for free, but if you're at that point for too many rounds, you have done something terribly wrong. Right. You have, you have not flipped the switch in a hurry. And, and this has that same kind of a feel to it as well. In fact, the whole card reservation element is, is reminiscent of that too. <sighs> it's interesting. This feels to me more, more that there's more possibilities to kind of play off of each other. I think it's because the engines you can build in different ways, right? There's, there's potentially multiple paths to victory. Sure. But you're right that it, it, there's an efficiency there that's going to be pretty necessary. That there's, if you're not finding that right chain, you're going to have a hard time keeping up. And if you just go for pure victory points off of things, that's not going to do it. You have to find ways of generating marbles with other marbles. Hmm. Right. I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but, but that's, the, the core of it is there are different ways you can build your engine in this as opposed to Splendor where it's just one. The only engine you're building in Splendor is a discount engine. You're discounting Correct. for future purchases. Whereas you can build a, a conversion engine in this or a marbles producing into other marbles kind of engine or a whenever I file a card, something cool happens or building blue cards specifically helps me kind of engine. There's, there's different twists on it and yet it has enough of a similar feel or vibe to Splendor that that they feel so tied together, right? They feel that that sure. switch flipping, that timing, that going from level one to level two to level three cards, that filing away. There's the different things. Ah, <sighs> because there's more going on, I think this is going to get to the table more often. Sean, for your money, is there enough engagement to where you feel clever with this? Because I think that's the big key for you is, do you feel clever enough? Yeah, absolutely. And there are games when, and part of it's the luck of the draw in one sense, because, well, not the draw, but what's available to you. So I'm trying to build a particular thing, but the right gizmos aren't coming up. That's where the research action can really help you because you can kind of dig for it, but you still might not see it. But like, for example, my final game, which was a two player game of this, Man, I had an incredible engine going. I, I literally doubled the points of the person I was playing against. In fairness, it was his first game of it. And it was my fourth game, right? So I had something where if I pick a, pick a black marble, I get a random draw. But I had another one that said if I pick a black or a yellow marble, I get a random draw. And then I had a conversion for black marbles to become something else. And then I had something else that said, uh, well, I had a, I had a level three gizmo that said my level two buildings cost one less. And then I had something that said when I, uh, when I build a card from my archive, I score a point. If it's a yellow card, I score a point. And so I was able to just put a bunch of stuff in my archive, a bunch of level twos, build them all very cheaply, uh, score a bunch of extra points. And then when it's time to pick a marble, I'm picking one marble, but getting like five marbles in yeah. one go. Yep. So it was fill back up, then build something, and then fill back up, or some other incidental marble things here or there. Uh, so yeah, I, this game absolutely makes me feel clever at times, which is, a, like you said, a, a big factor for me. I think some of the trick, and at least in the higher player count games, this, this struck me as a potential issue. I don't know if you saw this as the same issue, was turns could drag as a result of that because yes. of some of this... This turns into this, which turns into this, which turns into that. Running that engine is not always as, as smooth or as quick. Certainly not as quick as Splendor, which is the ultimate, do your turn, boom, do your turn, boom, do your turn, boom. This right. just doesn't play out like that. And, it, and you, it was noticeable, especially at the four-player counts. 
yeah, no, I agree. In fact, I would probably not play this at four again. Um, and in fact, I'm going, when we get to our final rating, I'm going to give this a split rating, Alex. Oh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull the, uh, the old Rob Rouse from Blue Peg, Pink Peg, uh, and it's going to have a split rating, whether it's two players or three players. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm. I didn't try it at two, so I, I actually can't, uh, can't speak too much about that, so I'm curious about your thoughts. Uh, all right. Hmm. So I mentioned that, so here's some issues that came up for me. So I mentioned that issue of you, you have this situation that comes up where the turns can take too long. The other thing that comes up for me is, and this is the same, this is not an issue that's unique to this game. This is an issue that you'll find in Splendor as well, really, is it feels a little too much like multiplayer solitaire again. That the, that the player interaction, the level of player interaction isn't significant. Where it comes up is, dang, that person took my marble, or dang, that person bought the card I wanted to buy. I, had, I was set up to get this one specific card, and now there's nothing with blue out there, so I can't get this card. <sighs> I think it's something that, again, you feel more at a four-player count. But it was enough that I, I certainly noticed it over multiple plays. And... And it had me, it, it dug away a little bit at the experience. Did that, did that multiplayer solitaire element hold it back for you too, Sean? It did at the higher player counts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I'm not playing it at four. And there, yeah, there's really not enough interaction. I mean, this is, the only interaction is, am I stealing a marble someone else needs or stealing a gizmo that they need? But for the most part, if you're, you're not doing it on purpose, you're not trying to cut someone off necessarily. Because you, if you're if you're playing that game, then you're not really developing your own gizmos. So yeah, that's multiplayer solitaire, but still quite enjoyable. Yes, absolutely. On the positive side, still quite enjoyable. I agree with you. the The engine building can lead to some moments of cleverness and cranking the engine in just the right way, and seeing how different people have uh, built different engines to to kind of operate and optimize better is entertaining and the game plays relatively smoothly when, when again, there isn't that issue of how long it takes for someone to crank their engine. It, it plays reasonably smoothly as, as we mentioned before, Sean, I think neither of us think this is a splendor killer. This might be as good a spot as any to talk about when, when do you bring this one off the shelf? When does this game hit the table for you? So I think, and I feel like this has happened before. What was, Oh, fog of love. So, Raquel and I are, are more than likely going to Empire tomorrow night for Dukes of Dice date night. And I want her to play this because I described the game to her. She's played Potion Explosion. She liked it well enough. And I think we need to make that comparison too. Both Simon games, both marble drawing. I like this better than Potion Explosion. Yeah, I'd agree. I 100% agree. And so if Raquel really likes this game at two players, then I will pick up a copy. Because I, I, I think that's the preferred play count. I want to play this. So if she really likes this, I think this would be a pretty good two-player experience for us. And I, and I would pick it up at that point. Because I, I don't know. Two, 2014, Sean would have given this game a five. I, I'm not getting him a final rating yet, but I'm just, I, I'm not giving this a five. But 2014, Sean would have given this game a five. Because it scratches a lot of itches. It has some great chain reactions and engine building. Uh, but I think I only really want to play this at two. I'll certainly play it at three. Like if it's set up, someone's like, hey, let's try this. Because it's a, it's a pretty easy teach. Uh, I sailed through teaching this a couple different times. It's, it's good. It's really good. But it's, it may not necessarily be my style of game. But certainly Raquel and I have been, unless it's Gloomhaven, We've been playing a lot lighter fare recently just because of the time that we have available to us with, uh, with uh, the, 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 the Juicer. So, yeah. so we'll see. We'll see if she likes it Friday night. What about Interesting. you? When, when would you pull this out? And I'm having a hard time thinking about that because there are, of, of these kinds of engine building games, you're right. You're not going to pull out Splendor in most any case with with your, with your board game crew, with the folks who are kind of regulars at game night or whatever else. Splendor is the gateway game. This is the gateway plus game. You can play it with someone who's gotten a couple of the more hobby games under their sure. belt, and they're going to do just fine. They might lag a little bit. 
and gamers themselves are going to find enough here to have some meat on the bone. So I think in most game nights, I'm, I'm more likely to pull this out than I'm going to pull Splendor out. I'm trying to think of other engine buildery kinds of games kind of in that Splendor vibe that I might, I might play over this. Yeah, I mean, Reef isn't really an engine builder. I like Reef a lot. But that's not that's not quite in that same category. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there's there are certainly enough situations where where this is a possibility. I don't think this is going to be an every week kind of game, but I think it's it certainly has a place. And I agree with you, by the way, going back to that thought about Potion Explosion versus this. Potion Explosion just wore thin after a certain amount of time. This has a little more staying power than Potion Explosion. It's possible that because, again, it's a, a little bit more on the dry side, that there's not going to be a, a, as, as much staying power come a year from now. It wouldn't surprise me if I haven't played this much, but I think there's a chance it, it will stick around longer and still be enjoyable, at least compared to Potion Explosion. So, Alex, uh, thematic? Eh, I mean, you're, you're building uh, a giant Rube Goldberg-esque contraption for a science fair, yeah, I guess, but it's it's certainly not like you attach the the whirly gizzlebob or whatever else to the machine. It's it's spelled out more dryly than that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's as thematic as Splendor is thematic. Exactly, yeah, exactly so, right. Which is fine. I don't I don't think it needs to be anything uh, anything more than that. All right, Alex, uh, any thoughts about this game over on the guild? Quite a few, actually, and, and the guild as a whole seemed to dig it. So so let's read through here, Evan. Uh, says, Phil Walker Harding hits another home run for me and my family with gizmos after the joyousness that's Cacao and Baron Park. The chaining effects in this game are pure awesomeness. I worry that the chaining effects would become overwhelming as you can only use the effect on each card once and keeping track of those things could be cumbersome towards the end of the game, but rarely do those effects become difficult to track and you feel super cool when you do them. I agree with that. I also love that good play is rewarded and there can be wide discrepancies in points, unlike, say, Splendor, where everything's so tight. The negative of this is that the game can be exhilarating or deflating depending on how the game flows, and people would be correct to say this game has a runaway leader problem. This is a perfect mix of light enough for newcomers, but strategic enough for hobbyists. That's an interesting point, Sean. Were, were there, uh, was there an, uh, enough of this that the game was a foregone conclusion? That there was enough of a chunk of the game that was played where you kind of knew the outcome? Did you find that was the case? Sometimes, but I think it was, like, like he said, like Evan said, it rewarded good play like when you know someone just has this incredible engine uh, yeah there's not much you can do about it but just try and you know put your best foot forward so it, that wasn't a problem for me i will say uh because hearing his thoughts for some reason reminded me of arcane academy oh yeah and which has similar things where you're chaining one action into another into another into another uh i will say that this has probably killed arcane academy which kind of fell off my radar anyway, but I would I would play this over Arcane Academy any, any day. I disagree on that. I I, well, I still like Arcane Academy more. Arcane Academy really? is a, a higher standing in my head than Gizmos. Yeah, wow. I would say so. All right. So Sylvain Lacrosse said, first of all, I love engine building games. Terraforming Mars is my favorite game of all time, and I'm also a huge fan of Race for the Galaxy and Glory to Rome. Three amazing titles right there, by the way. This said, when I heard about Gizmos, I was skeptical. A pure engine building game that's easy to learn and plays in 45 minutes? It can't be possible. Well, after five games of Gizmos, I can now tell you that this is possible. Gizmos is actually a really simple to understand and quick to teach, but it also gives you that I feel great about the awesome combo I just made feeling. Combos are easy to pull, and I love the chain reactions you can do. But on the downside, I think there might be some replayability issues. After a few games, most of the combos will probably feel more of the same. But in the end, it's a cheap, awesome-looking, fun combo engine builder that's really great. I will give it a 5 on the Ducal scale, but it might drop to a 4 after a dozen plays. But I'm not there yet, and this game is right in my wheelhouse. There you go. And, and I don't know why, Sean. I, I feel like he's, all the points he's making are, are generally correct, and I'm not quite as high or as excited as he is. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Uh, okay, we don't know how to pronounce this name. It's, it is E-O-R-L Osborne. So, Eorl? Osborne says, After grabbing Gizmos recently, my son has been obsessed. We played it so many times and almost always play a second game as soon as the first is over. He swiftly decided that it is now his favorite game, even before he won a single game. 
He is a big cult of the new kid, though, and half of the games he personally owns are by Phil Walker Harding, so what should I have expected? He has also managed to pull off two tight wins over me in our last two games. That's pretty cool and pretty rewarding, and I can get why that would have a special place. I can imagine if I had a kid and, uh, and all of a sudden it's their favorite game, I'm going to be higher on it, too. Just, uh, just how it is, unless that game happens to be Machi Koro, in which case I've made some terrible parenting decisions. By the way, Aoral, I was like, that sounds super familiar. Uh, the Rohirrim from Lord of the Rings. It's the house of Aoral. He was one of the, the earlier kings of, of the Rohirrim. Yep. The Riders of Rohan. You know what I'm talking about? The Horse Lords? Yes. Theoden? Mm-hmm. Okay. Totally on board. Yep. Picking up what you you're seen, laying have down. Have you seen those movies? I've seen I've, uh, the new ones, the Hobbit ones. No, no. What? No, get out of here. No, the, the Lord, of the Ring, Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yeah, I had the extended editions on DVDs. I saw them all. Okay. But it's been a while. I watch Fellowship at least once a year. God, I love Fellowship of the Ring. Ah, it's so good. I recall it being very good. Yeah, it's, that's it's fair. It's the best. It's the best of all three. Hey, let's talk about final thoughts and ratings instead of rings. One ring, Alex, to rule them all. One rating to rule them all? What rating are you giving it? It's not a one. No, it's certainly not a one. So we rate things here at the Dukes of Dice on a six-point scale. A one is poorly designed, but playable. Why do we have to say it's playable? Why can't we just say it's poorly? I guess a zero would be not playable. Right. Uh, Poorly designed, but playable, not necessarily fun. Six is an all-time favorite that is a contender for the top 10. And I had alluded that four years ago, I would have probably given this game a five, which is a great game. We'll rarely turn down a play of it. But because of the way my tastes have changed, that's just not going to apply for me. I also alluded to the fact, Alex, that I'd be giving this a mixed rating, or or a split rating, rather, one for two players and one for three players. And so I'm going to give this game a four rating if if I'm playing it two players. Four is a good game, worth playing, just on all the time. Uh, It belongs to the Duchy. And that's assuming Raquel's going to like it, and I'm pretty sure she will. Uh, so if I'm playing this at three or four, and I really don't want to play this at four, but if I'm playing it at the higher player counts, game is okay. Not exciting. We'll play in the right situation. So that's really meaning that I will, you know, set up, I'm at a con, whatever. Hey, do you want to jump in? Hey, can you teach this? Hey, whatever. Sure. Why not? I think there's also the possibility that several years from now, um, this is something that Chewy would like. I think that. Uh, yeah, we'll try Splendor first and then, uh, and then maybe some Century Spice Road and we'll work our way up to this. But yeah, so for now, I mean, if I'm going to pick one of the ratings, I'm, 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 I'm going to call it a four for all intents and purposes. It is, it is more four than a three. Uh, but I think my, my very much preferred play count is, is two, two players. Hmm. Makes sense. Okay. Well, uh, Sean, I, I think I would have come into this. I think 2014 Alex might have also been at a five on this one, too. Uh, I, think, I think, though, there, this does a lot really well, right? This, this yes. is uh, a really solid effort. The, the game itself is a nice iteration, and I think for some is going to be an improvement on Splendor. And there's something just holding it back just a little bit. Not a ton, but enough to give this thing a four. A good game worth playing, just not all the time. But the key to this belongs in the duchy. Uh, I, I like having access to this thing. I think it's going to be a perfect fit at, at most game nights. It's not going to hit the table all the time, but it's going to find that right time where, hey, you got about 45 minutes for a game. Hey, why not Gizmos? I'm not going to turn that down very often. It's, it's, it's going to make sense. It's going to be good. It's going to be solid, and hopefully I'm playing it with three players, which is my preferred count. I have yet to try it at two. Maybe I'll like it better there. But yeah, uh, I think that's the right score for it. A four. Four. Good game worth playing, just not all the time. Belongs in the duchy. So that's going to do it for our review of Gizmos. Sean gives it a split rating, a four if you're playing with two, a three if you're playing with three, and a did not participate if you're playing with four. And I just give this game a straight four. You are listening to the Dukes of Dice, proud members of the Dice Tower Network. For other great shows in the network, check out Dicetowernetwork.com. Back to Alex and Sean for this week's Dukes Double Take. All right, next up is a Dukes Double Take. Looking back on an episode where, Sean, I was back, I was here. Well, I was in St. I was in St. Louis at that point. But uh 
didn't didn't participate a ton in this one. Yeah. This is episode 159, Captain's Log, referring to Lignum from Capstone Games. Hey, we mentioned them earlier. Sean, at the time you gave this one a five, you said you would only want to play it at, at four players at that count, but you want to keep playing because you were bad and you wanted to get better. So bad at this game. Yeah, 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 yeah. Matthew, who reviewed this with you, also gave it a five, thought he'd give it a six, uh, but the, there was just some little things with the, the, the cards and the art, wanted Capstone to make some tweaks, but th- said there was a possibility this might go up to a six a year later. So, Sean, have you played this game since? Yeah, I've, I've played it once since, and it's going to stay at a five. Man, it is... Oh, I'm still terrible at this game, and that desire to do better, be better is definitely there. The, the big component of this game is um, the planning. Uh, basically, you have, you're kind of saying, I bet, sort of bet, that on this particular turn, several turns from now, I'm going to take this particular action, and it makes that action so much more powerful. But man, if you screw up with that planning, it is a waste and it is super punishing. It's also got kind of that, uh, that, that circuit style placement where you can jump as far ahead as you like, but you can't go back. Uh, but if I jump all the way, you know, super far ahead, then people behind me have their pick of a whole, a whole bunch of stuff. And I, I like those games quite a bit. Uh, there's some interesting tension that, that you have there. Whether it's uh, Glenn Moore or Heaven and Nail, um, it, I, I like it quite a bit, and it's good. It is, it is really good. Don't ever play this game, Alex. Sorry, don't play it. Don't play it. Never play don't this play game. It. Got nope, it. Nope, nope, nope. Okay. This is definitely not an Alex game. Uh, but yeah, so I'm I'm gonna keep it at at a five, which is a great game. Will rarely turn down a play of it. But man, is it punishing. Ooh, boy. So reached out to Wham Boy Matthew, kind of last second, a little bit before we recorded. Hadn't heard back from him yet, so I don't know what he's doing with his score on this. And maybe we'll post it in the thread on the guild uh, when this episode drops. And if he has some thoughts on it, those can go there. Hey, that makes sense. But the guild had some other thoughts on this game, Sean. Phil Naxer says, Lignum is still loved after a year of ownership. The theme and art still... uh, The theme and art still require some poking and prodding to get new players to the table. I've played the expansion once and found it loosened the game up just a bit. It mostly added a new layer of complexity to work around. I guess I'm still enjoying the base game too much. Five out of six, and he makes the extra point of, with the Meeple Realty insert, this is a game about wood, organized with wood, filled with wood. Wood all around, Sean. Wood for everyone. Wood for everybody. Wood for wood. Ben Coberly says, Lignum is in my top five favorite games. It's definitely heavy, but once you get the flow of the game, turns can be quick and the decisions you have to make are often agonizing. I think it's a must to play with the building and joiner expansions because it really opens the game up and can give you a real diverse strategy. You are struggling to eke out every dollar to get the victory. Every time I play Lignum, I walk away saying, man, I loved that. I want more. I can do better. That's how I want every game I play to be. And that sounds a lot kind of like what I'm, what I'm saying. I mean, yeah, you are just fighting tooth and nail for every piece of uh, the different types of wood and for the money to do stuff. And, uh, and I'm so terrible at it. I just, I want to get better at the game. Just want to, want to. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's sort of how I felt after playing Indonesia. So I kind of get that feeling actually. And I don't know. Slowly getting intrigued here. Hmm. 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 Anyway, Hmm. Evan says, Lignum is one of my favorite heavy games. A really excellent brain-burning design. Everything here is so well done. The theme is fantastic. There's nothing in my collection like Lignum. It's by far the heaviest game I own, and I own a lot of heavy games. I find myself saying, I hate this game when I really love it. This game has everything. Intense planning, high player interaction, and tension. Just awesome. Might be too brain burny for some people with a theme that won't attract everyone, but I dig it. Five out of six. So it's funny to me because I say the same thing. When I really love a game, I'm there at the table with my head in my hands, my hair all all over the place because I'm just like pulling my hair out. And I'm just thinking, I hate this bleeping game, which means I, I love it because it's so agonizing. 
And for some reason, I, I find that enjoyable. I find making agonizing decisions in a game enjoyable. It's not like I do that every day in real life for my job or anything. Yeah. Yeah, okay. well, hey, do what you love, Sean, and you'll never work a day in your life. There you go. Well, that's the Duke's double take. Sean keeps it at a five. I didn't rate it. And Matthew, I don't know, go to the guild and figure it out. Before we go, though, let's talk about the rest of the top six. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, Sean, this was a fierce one. Let's talk about the ones that weren't in contention for this, all right? Let's start off with one that I didn't quite understand uh, from Mike White, Logwai, which is based off of Gremlins, which I have not seen. Sean, can you explain this? Yeah, so Gremlins, is, which is a fantastic movie, it is the second best Christmas movie, the first being... H- Home Alone? I don't know. I thought Home Alone was going to come in there. What? Die Hard. Okay, thanks, Alex. Thanks for participating. Um, no, what? No, Die Hard and then and then Gremlins. Uh, so yeah, the, the Gremlin, the, the main Gremlin, the little cute guy, his name is Gizmo, which is the name of the board game we're, we're talking about, right? But they're also, the species are Mogwai. So he took the logs from Lignum and turned Mogwai into Logwai. So pretty smart. Pretty uh, pretty clever there. I like pretty, it. pretty clever, Mike. Pretty, pretty clever. Yeah. Uh, the <laughs> other one, another one was Rob Rouse from Blue Peg, Pink Peg, who we mentioned before. He suggested Tinker Toys. Did you ever play with Tinker Toys, Alex? They... They had like the little like connectors. Like, I wonder if they're plastic now. I think they used to be wood when when I was young. And, uh, and you, they have like spokes, and you could build these cool structures with them. So I was more of a Lego and Connects kid. Yeah, I had. You could have them all, Alex. I had them all. Well, I didn't have them all. I just had those two. Uh, but yeah, this this one was pretty clever. Tinkering, referencing, uh, tinkering with an invention, gizmos, and then Tinker Toys, referencing wood from Lignum. It was a nice combo. It was well done. Good job, Rob. What's uh, what's the other one that's not in contention? And by the way, we should say to say that they're not in contention is not to say that they're they're bad by any stretch of the imagination. No, These in fact, really in fact, good. the top six was very, 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 very competitive this week. Yes, there were a lot of uh, names that would have made it easily any other week that just there wasn't room for in the top six. In any case, D. Shannon came with. I thought this was really funny. Wood for beep. Yeah, nice little Catan reference. You get lignum in there. The beep for the 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 sound the machine might make. Dug it. I really dug it. Nice job. So the three, the three ones that we're just like, yeah, these are. The, it's going to be one of these three, and we couldn't, we couldn't pick one. And like you were saying at the top of the episode, we couldn't even like pick one that to, to fight for because they were all really good. So we had Lincoln Cogs with Nick Pays, which was the actual episode title. But the other one, or one of the other two, was from the Dame Father, Steve Ward, Tech Trees. Uh, tech for gizmos, trees for lignum, but the whole concept of having tech trees in, in various games like Empire Building Games or Twilight Imperium, whatever. R- really, really solid name there. And what was the third one there, Alex? Jesse Metcalf came with Chainsaw Reactions, which mm. was such a good name. I think there was another guild member who posted the same name uh, a little further down in the thread, which not the first time that's happened. But yeah, that was that was really solid. And any really any of the three of those would have been a fine fine choice so yeah so as we were as we were deliberating pre-show which which name we were going to pick i made the comment that i am instantly from here on out uh devaluing any of of the name father's suggestions by 20 percent. yeah 20 a 20 percent discount they fall 20 percent in my estimation as i compare them to others that's the that's the handicap he gets as uh, as the name father, because he's he's that good. So what we did was we did a three-way schwazi. So I held up my phone. I said, thumb is this one, index finger, middle finger is this one. Put them on, you verified. But the handicap was that if Steve got picked for the first one, we would do a redo. And if he, if he went again, you know, back to back. Uh, so it really takes him from a one in three, wow, to a one in nine. <laughs> Uh, which was probably a bit of an overstep. Yeah. Yeah, we overcompensated there a bit. I don't know. We're gamers. Maybe we'll come up with a better way of doing this next time. But uh, boy, this was this was tricky. So we did the initial Schwazi. And sure enough, Schwazi picked Siva Works for the first one. But because of our self-imposed rules, we we went again and it, uh, it picked Nick Hayes' Lincoln Cogs. 
for folks who are relatively new to the, the naming scene, by the way, Steve O'Rourke, if you look, and I just updated the, the Duke's episode leaderboard, has named 13 episodes. 13 Dukes of Dice episodes. The next closest is Jimmy, Jimmy DM90, with eight, then Neil Hoffman with six. And then there's a group of five, but but you have to go down quite a ways. He is ahead by five names of the next closest person. And it was almost, it was, it was another one in three shot away from being six ahead. So, man oh man, he good at naming stuff. Well, let's point out though, there was a bit of a scandal, Alex. Yes, okay. A- akin, akin to like a Miss America losing her crown. Except with far less drama because it occurred way after the fact. So back in episode 157, uh, for some reason on the episode, which was named uh, The Fog Father, I can't remember what we were talking about there. I think Via Nebula was one of the games. It yes. might have been the double take. Oh, it was The Godfather and Via Nebula. There we go. Fog Father. Okay. Baker Mitchell submitted the name, that name, The Fog Father. Now, he didn't do something that is typically done on the guild these days, which is bold any name suggestions. So they stick out as, well, name suggestions. And I don't know why, but we gave credit during the episode and on the leaderboard to Kyle Kelly for that. Whoops, not his name, it was Baker's. The record has now been corrected after Baker, in a very, very kind Board Game Geek message, but it was like, hey, maybe go back and check the tape on this one. And sure enough, he's right. We screwed it up. I don't know how we screwed it up, but uh, it's been adjusted. Sorry, Kyle, you got knocked down from the three-time namers crowd to uh, the two-time namers. So, eh, it is what it is. Well, we'll say he's an honorary member. I guess. I don't know. I, well, I don't know that. I don't know that you fully afforded him due process. Did you reach out to him to give him an, an explanation of whether or not? I mean, was there some reason he was credited? Did he receive proper notice, Alex? I what? Did he have a chance to respond? No. You've denied Kyle Kelly his due process. Okay. That's all I'm saying. All right. Well, I'll check with my lawyer about that and see if uh, there's anything I can do about this. Nope. Nope. You're going to jail. Nope. That's- oh, jeez. Okay. Well, that escalated quickly. As your lawyer, you're going to jail. Thanks. I need. I have the worst freaking lawyers. <laughs> oh, let's wrap this. Let's wrap. Let's wrap this bad boy up, Sean. It's okay. late. Yeah. Well, that's gonna do it. Yeah, we got a little bit of a late start here, Alex. But that's all right. So yeah, let's uh, wrap up episode 185. Once again, Lincoln Cogs. Great episode title from Nick Hayes. Good job, Nick. Uh, Thanks everyone else in the guild for your contributions as well. Until next time, this is Sean. And Alex. And Duke you later, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Dukes of Dice. Today's episode was recorded in the Duchy on September 27th, 2018. Our theme music provided by Carbohydro M from his Prime Legacy album. The Dukes of Dice are a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. For other great board gaming podcasts, check out DiceTowerNetwork.com. And for all the ladies of the Duchy, go to DukesOfDice.com. Find us on Twitter at Dukes of Dice. Join in conversations on our Board Game Geek Guild. Find us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks to our sponsors, Tasty Mistral Games, Arcane Wonders, and Game Toppers, LLC. You can check out all of TMG's titles at PlayTMG.com. Arcane Wonders games at arcanewonders.com and learn more about Game Toppers at GameToppersLLC.com. We'll see you back here in two weeks. Until then, game on.